All right, good evening everyone and welcome to our meeting tonight. Uh, good evening fellow humanists and friends and welcome to the humanist at BUC meeting. I am Jay Laban for the folks that have not met me yet. I believe all of you have by now. And I am uh, glad to be serving as the meeting host. I'd like to start as usual by welcoming everyone, especially our humanist friends from the Southeast Michigan Humanist Organization. So today's meeting is gonna be a bit different than the regular meetings, as many of you know. We usually have a 20 to 30 minute speech by a featured speaker talking about a humanist uh, topic. And then we follow up with some uh, questions to the speaker. So today is gonna be slightly different. And, and, um, and the fact that uh, instead of having a feature speaker, today we will have the chance to share our stories on how we became humanists. The why, the how, and when did we be, um, become humanists. So you basically it's your journeys today. I'm excited about tonight's meeting, excited to hear about all the stories. Each one of us has their own story about how they realized or they became humanists. So in preparing for today's meeting, many of you probably noticed the emails coming from Larry uh, Friedman asking for volunteers. And I wanna start by thanking the five volunteers that stepped up and decided to share their humanist uh, journey uh, with us. So just a couple of reminders before we get going. First, regarding the, um, the recording, I made here a note of them, just to make sure that I read all of those because there's a lot of reminders. I'd like to remind you that our meetings are being recorded. If you're uncomfortable with the setting, you can still participate in our meetings. You are welcome to attend our meeting. Just a reminder, Zoom will only record the participant that are speaking. So as long as you do not participate in that part of the meeting, then you will not be recorded. Also, I've noticed that some, some of us use, like I do, a setting we can see everyone on, on one screen. So just for those folks, please make sure if you are gonna uh, stand up, you're gonna move in the background, just like in the physical meetings, please make sure that you turn off your video Turn it off in case you need to stand up, go to the restroom or go grab a water, a glass of water or a glass of your favorite beverage. So at this time I have muted everyone. You can unmute yourself by right clicking to your name, on your name and selecting unmute. If you are using a traditional phone like a land, land-based phone, you can also do that by using the star six command, okay? Okay, so our first speaker for tonight was supposed to be Larry Larson. Larry, are you with us? Let me see if I can unmute him. I can still see audio to connecting to audio. Let's see, Larry. I don't think he's still with us. So we'll go ahead to the next speaker that we have. Uh, John, thank you so much for volunteering. Uh, if you could please unmute yourself or I can unmute you from my side, John Cleveland host. And you can go yep. ahead and share should with us. Be, what you're that's right. Should be unmuted right now. How's that look? He sounds great. Go All ahead. right. Okay. Well, then... Uh, do you want me to start? Yes, go ahead. All right. I'm trying to strictly stick to this five minute deal, so it's gonna be a little tight, but here we go. Okay, um, it's great to see everybody. I'm John Cleland Host, nice to meet you. Um, I was my uh, basic uh, humanist journey, here we go. Uh, it's not quite conventional, a little bit, familiar? Maybe we'll see. Anyway, I was raised Roman Catholic and 
that was really cool. I had a, a really quite a good childhood. I was, um, I was an altar boy and lots of typical Catholic type stuff. And one of the neat things about that was just because of who my parents are, I was raised with a lot of exposure to and enjoyment of the natural world, of nature. Um, so in a Catholic context, this was all, oh, you know, we have a wonderful God's creation around us and stuff like that. And I really got a chance to experience the, um, the woods here in Michigan, the animals, the joy of the seasons that we have here, and so on. But as I grew up, I came across some problems. As a Catholic, I came across some logical problems, basic things like hold on a second, if I was born in Iran, I'd almost certainly be a Muslim, and then I'd be tortured forever in hell for not being Catholic. What kind of just God would do that? And so there's a whole bunch of those. It would take a long time to go into those, but I even took those to the priest, and I went to the priest, and I said, hey, this is the problem, and I was amazed that I did not get any clear answers. So after a while, I realized oh my gosh, they, after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they don't even have clear answers here. And I became a pretty stereotypical atheist. And, and that was okay. But, you know, being raised Catholic, I really liked all that fun stuff with candles and incense and holidays and all this kind of stuff. And so I thought, well, what unites us as human beings I thought, you know, I could watch the sunrise on the winter solstice. Wouldn't that be incredible? And I did that, and it was amazing because it connected me to thousands and thousands of years, hundreds and hundreds of generations of human beings on all the continents across the Earth, except Antarctica, where the winter solstice has been watched. And I thought, this is really cool. So... I met my wife, Heather, around that time, and we started to add the summer solstice, the equinoxes, and we also added the halfway points in between those, which are the thermstices and the equitherms. Those are the same analogs for the temperature cycle. There's lots of scary math involved. And I realized, I found out that a bunch of pagan people celebrate these same eight holidays making the wheel of the year. So um, I, can, uh, I can show what that looks like if I, um, let me see here. Anyway, we, so I started to celebrate those holidays and I was amazed at how fun it was. It was really cool. So celebrating those holidays brought me a lot of the fun and color and holidays and emotions and the rituals that we need as human beings. We've evolved with parts of our brain that are deeply touched by these things, deeply touched in ways that are usually satisfied by the traditional religions that tap into those and make people think that, oh, we need this religion because of these things. But I found out that that's not the case at all by having a completely reality-based spirituality and celebrating real holidays, the solstices and equinoxes are actual events based on the sun and the moon. They're not based on some you know, mythical legend that may or may not have happened sometime in the distant past. And so I found with my family, my kids and my wife, this was a lot of fun to be a naturalistic, pagan, naturalistic in the sense that there's no supernatural, but pagan in the sense that I celebrate the solstices and equinoxes and the connection to our earth that way. So to close, um, a quote from Carl Sagan, one of my heroes, even though he didn't like that term, comes to mind. And Carl Sagan told us, a religion old or new that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able 
to draw forth the, re the reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by our conventional faiths. I think I found that. It's really, really cool to be alive. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for sharing your the journey and so much for such a eloquent speech. And, uh, and by the way, I, I hope we can do this more than once. So hopefully cool. we can do this once and come back and dive more into the reason why we did this or we did that or we think this way or that way. So there's, hopefully we'll have more than one chance. Mm -hmm. I know today we're limiting, limiting to five minutes, but uh, I hope we can come back and revisit this as well. So Larry Larson, are you with us? And you can always unmute yourself, Larry, with a pound six. So if you are, please go ahead and give us a signal. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, Larry. Oh, wonderful. Well, I don't know what happened. I just couldn't uh, use my headset that has a microphone in it. <clears throat> but uh, thanks, Jay, for uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, and hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to talk about my religious history and as well as types of humanism. I was an evangelical Protestant fundamentalist until the age of 11, until the age of 17. I, started, I got saved when I was 11, uh, accepting Jesus as my personal savior. You might've heard that expression, but but it had a profound effect on me because I was rather unsociable. I rejected worldly activities like uh, card playing and movies and dancing, even uh, people that were liberal. Liberal Christianity was called modernism and it was, that was supposed to be terrible. And then I went to college and studied zoology and the professor shocked me by saying it wasn't uh, evolution wasn't a theory it was a fact and, and then I discovered that um, evolution was a fact and in fact that uh, the world wasn't just 6,000 years old so I became very interested in uh, liberal uh, liberal religion in Grand Rapids where I was brought up. I was rejecting supernaturalism and seeking evidence-based philosophy. And uh, I was searching for the good life, which I think is the basis for humanism. My values became centered on creativity as a source of life and love and human flourishing. I looked at uh, toward character development and I thought it was based on improving my relationships. And I think I became a religious humanist at that point. My focus was not getting to heaven, but was on promoting human, uh, human welfare and making the world a better place. I valued the scientific, the scientific method and keeping an open mind and being tolerant. I rejected the major religions, but I saw the value in congregational style religion, which I found at uh, BUC, and a religion without a creed. And uh, now I've become more of a spiritual humanist in the last uh, 10 years, and that's when I joined the church 10 years ago. By the way, before uh, before joining the church, I was wasn't attending church for 55 years, and uh, now my focus was on improving relationships with my family and among friends and the church community. I was concerned more with uh, relationships with neighbors and my the city doing something helpful for the, to the city and the state the country and the whole world I, I i think i call it spiritual humanism because it's 
it has to do with relationships which are invisible, and so is uh, and so are spirits. So it's not nothing uh, miraculous, or it's just relationships like father and son and husband and wife. But then I learned to value and celebrate compassion and generosity and gratitude, forgiveness, freedom, tolerance, justice, mercy, and humility. And uh, I developed friendships at BUC and becoming more of a social activist as well as a charitable activist. And uh, I guess I'm running out of time here, but five years ago, several of us started this humanist group. I I thought that... uh, I was afraid some people wouldn't want to be at BUC because they weren't spiritual or religious and and they fit into our humanist group. And uh, I had kind of a problem with the minister at that time, but she finally realized that we, we weren't going to proselytize. And uh, so the present minister is great. And she's got, a, I think she's got a new uh, type of humanism called theistic humanism, believe it or not. She says she's a humanist, and uh, she's also a theist. So on August the 9th, I think it is, she's going to be talking to our group, and I can ask her about uh, how she can reconcile humanism and theism. That's, That's it for me, and thanks for giving me the chance to talk. Thank you so much, Larry. Thank you for sharing. This is the first time that I hear your story, so I'm glad that you uh, were um, was willing to share with us that sometimes it can be difficult for us to share our our stories, and it takes courage. So I appreciate that a lot. Thank you. All right, our uh, next speaker is uh, Brad. If Brad is ready, you can unmute yourself, sir. Brad is also part of the uh, BUC. Humanist uh, Planning Committee. So go ahead, sir. Unmute yourself. If you are having problem, I can unmute you if you would like, or you can do it yourself, whichever is easier. Well, I think I'm good. I just took some notes to try to stuff this into five minutes. My uh, uh, commendations to the first two folks for, uh, <clears throat> for keeping us online. So I think, let me start my timer. And um, I uh, had had some similarities here. I was uh, also raised as a a Protestant. My uh, dad, given my last name, was raised Catholic. Uh, My mom was going to convert and uh, they were told that would cost some money to have the wedding when they wanted to. So instead, my dad converted, converted the other way. I remember that uh, as a teenager, I had... uh, I uh, asked my grandmother on her deathbed if she knew Jesus. So I had uh, this, I remember I had this thought. And in uh, early college, I was met by somebody on the streets that said he believed in, indiv- in world peace through individual happiness. I thought, okay. And this turned out to be uh, a Buddhist an invitation to come and join them. Uh, and I was a... Uh, a practicing Buddhist for a couple of years before I went away to uh, uh, a different college. And uh, I'm wondering is, if, uh, I was thinking, I wonder if this is one of the religions, I'm assuming it is, that uh, the uh, school teaches. I saw that the kids service had uh, a lot of things about different, different religions there. Um, when I was away at college, um, I had a roommate that was uh, very religious, uh, and so, uh, he was uh, did missionary work in Africa, uh, helping them get water there. But um, I, I asked him one time, I said, Randy, what if somebody dies uh, there? He's a teenager, and um, he wasn't able to uh, ask to be saved. And Randy said, well, Brad, he, he could if he'd wanted to, if he really wanted to. So I thought, well, that's kind of tough because even when I see things, it uh, it's hard to get them through my head some sometimes. So I just I just thought that was uh, tough. We also then my wife and I thought a lot similar. We attended a uh, um, 
it wasn't a universalist church in Westland. It was similar. For uh, about a year and a half, two years, we attended Marianne Williamson's uh, church, uh, the gal that was a uh, POTUS, um, mm -hmm. a candidate that uh, just dropped out recently, um, her church in Warren. Um, when we, uh, every time we left the service, my wife thought it was wonderful, but it was a little too obtuse with me. I wasn't sure what I heard. So I think uh, probably uh, then I also fell away from uh, attending church for some time. And I think mm -hmm. until uh, I was uh, woken up again in, uh, after 9-11. And I said, how can those people be so hateful? So mm -hmm. that's why I studied to uh, started to look a lot at religion. I decided that uh, this wasn't maybe this religion, this was extremists. And uh, I think a lot of different groups have extreme folks um, there. But um, then I uh, just think we have to watch out for that. And then I started to ask more. I, I asked people what one plus one is. And everybody says, well, that's, that's two, Brad. And then uh, no matter where they're from, but then I ask them about the religion. I say, how can it be that you have, a, so mathematics is just a way to express things. And if you are uh, looking at how to describe all of human nature, how come it's normally dependent on the zip code where you grew up? I found most people, they don't, uh, if they're raised one way, they, they may explore a little bit, but a lot of folks uh, tend to stay that same way. So I think this is uh, uh, just difficult in uh, 2018. I heard a TED talk. Uh, it stands for Technology, Education, and Design. And I'm probably up to, I used to listen to one each way on my commute, and I do it now on the lawn, probably listen to 500. Mm -hmm. And I want to uh, in, uh, encourage everyone, uh, one, I heard one that was uh, called Why I Choose Humanism Over Faith. And this person was uh, in one of the poorest countries in Africa, and he said, I think this is, this is bad that my people are taught to pray and wait for something to happen instead of going out and trying to make something to happen for themselves. So I thought that, that was my introduction uh, to humanism. I didn't know the term uh, before a couple of years ago. Uh, so today I'm glad to have found the uh, uh, other Southeast Michigan chapter and then uh, was there just a few times and uh, then uh, found the current group today. And I think that it supports my, uh, my values. It values, um, like Larry said, it values uh, evidence on uh, working with evidence. And I'd uh, also like to become more of, a, I think, an activist uh, uh, in here. And I hope that uh, we can get into uh, more out, outreach, type, uh, outreach type activities, because I think that's what a lot of, uh, I see churches do. But if I could help out without it being, uh, with, with it being a more generic faith-based. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brad. All right, our next speaker is uh, is Larry Friedman, and Larry is also one of the co-founders of uh, the Humanist at BUC group. Larry is involved heavily also in the church. Go ahead, Larry. <clears throat> thank you, Brad. Um, my background is a little different than others who became humanists. I didn't reject any formal religion. I didn't have a religion and I was looking for a religion. And actually I didn't realize it, but the time I became a humanist was in October, 1957, when I proposed to my wife, Marilyn. I didn't realize at the time, but that's the turning point in my life, my journey towards humanism. I didn't have any uh, religious, real religion when I was brought up. My father had a Jewish background. My mother was a Lutheran. Uh, I was told I was Jewish because my name was Jewish. I was allowed to stay home from school on Jewish holidays because my father didn't think it would be good for me to go to school. Uh, but as far as religion, we, we uh, every time around Passover, we, we went to my grandmother's house in uh, Brooklyn and. Uh, had a great meal. I wasn't a seder, but it was a delicious meal with matzo balls and gefilte fish and all the trimmings. I went to some bar mitzvahs of some of my cousins. I didn't understand at all the purpose of them or what was going on, but I enjoyed the parties. 
there was a Jewish temple where we lived in the suburbs in uh, Westchester County, uh, but we was right around the, during the Depression. My uh, father lost quite a bit of money in the Depression in real estate. We couldn't afford to join the temple. My mother didn't care about it anyway. We did celebrate uh, Christmas and Easter. I think my mother was responsible for that. She was brought up having presents for Christmas and Easter eggs, and uh, my father didn't seem to care. I didn't think he was certainly not a religious. I went, when I went to college, uh, I went to the New York University campus in the Bronx, where there was an arts and science college and an engineering college, all men, probably 75% Jewish from the from the Bronx, so most of my friends and I had a fraternity friends were uh, were Jewish, and probably half of those wanted to be doctors. And uh, joined joined the Glee Club, and of course, like any other choir, the club we sang a lot of religious music because that's beautiful music. Uh, uh, in fact, the director was the director of the New York Oratorio Society, which formed Handel's Messiah every year, which my uh, my older brother sang with. So um, I, uh, soon after college, I was drafted in the army. Uh, there was only other, one other real religious person in my squad, uh, very uh, uh, religious Protestant, and uh, he didn't try to convert anybody, but he was about the only one who really, I think, talked about God or anything religious. Um, I do remember uh, that I, I was allowed, to, because I, I said I was Jewish, I was allowed to go to Jewish services on Sabbath and avoid army detail on Saturdays. Uh, so soon after I was drafted, uh, a couple years later, I met my wife, Marilyn, and she, she was brought up in a Jewish home, but very non-religious, both her mother and dad were Jewish, but they didn't really practice. And I certainly wasn't, so uh, I didn't think much about it. When we were talking about, I figured we'd get, find some uh, reformed Jewish rabbi to marry us or a reformed temple. But no, when I said, let's get married, she said, okay, but we have to get married in the Ethical Culture Society. I didn't know at all what she meant. I said, I, uh, I didn't care as long as we were gonna get married. And uh, she said, oh, it's good, it's very liberal, and you'll like it. So we went to visit the Ethical Culture Society in New York. It's an imposing building on Central Park West. They, uh, I learned later they probably have a 1,000 members. There's only 10,000 Ethical Culture members in the country, and then probably half of those were in the New York area, and a 1,000 in the New York Society with two full-time leaders. But what struck me immediately was above the chancel was the slogan, the place where people meet to seek the highest is holy ground. And that really struck me, but of course, this sounds good. This, this is probably what I believe. I was really thought I was an agnostic in college and everything. I didn't know if it was a God or not. It wasn't important to me. But this seemed like something, and then we had conversations with one of the leaders, that they, the leaders, not ministers, about marriage. And I said, you know, is this really a religion? Well, he said, let me tell you what, Felix Schadler said, who was a Jewish rabbi who founded the ethical culture movement, he said, ethical culture is religious to those who are religiously minded and merely ethical to those who are not so minded. Well, that sounded good to me. I didn't know which I was at the time. Humanism was hardly mentioned. The fact that he said that the ethical culture society is part of the uh, international Humanist and Ethical Union. Um, and that's, that's about all he said about humanism. And uh, we did go there, but, but I, I, at the time I was working in Long Island, so we, uh, we visited the Long Island Society of Ethical Culture in Hampstead, Long Island. That was an odd, uh, odd experience because they met in an odd fellows hall. And we were certainly odd fellows, but we had a pleasant time. Uh, I don't think we ever became members because I was getting disillusioned. I was working for the Boy Scouts of America, and uh, I was uh, beginning to worry about promising to live, obey this. Uh, you know, the Scouts' oath, which talks about God, and then 
I was responsible for organizing all kinds of Cub Pack scout troops, and most of them came from Catholic parishes and uh, Protestant churches. It was uh, after the war and the baby boomers were booming, we had, couldn't keep up with the demand. And every church wanted to have a scout troop or a Cub Pack. And, uh, and with that and with the financial situations, uh, I decided to take a job in New Jersey. We moved to New Jersey and joined the uh, Bergen County Ethical Society, and that was a very pleasant experience. And uh, I still didn't know much about humanism. Uh, and uh, although it was mentioned once in a while, there wasn't anything that was seriously talked about in the, in the society or elsewhere. I, I left New Jersey to work in, and we moved to Pittsburgh area for two, two years. <clears throat> and there wasn't any ethical society, so we found out, I, the, my brother said, why don't you look, look, look for Unitarian Society Fellowship. He was a Unitarian in Chicago. We found a small fellowship with probably about 50 members in the, in the suburb where we lived, and that was very pleasant, very non-religious. <clears throat> Most of them had rejected Catholicism or Protestantism and just wanted to have a community of people who enjoyed doing things for others and improving their lives. And they, they, they steered away from anything religion. In fact, we had hymnals, but they didn't want to use the hymnals except once a month when the minister from the Pittsburgh Unitarian Church would came to uh, talk. We had to have the visit the, the hymnals out so he could lead us in the hymn. Well, that's the way it was. I didn't really know much about humanism until I found out that I was going to move to Michigan because uh, of a job change. I told our, our former leader in Bergen who had become the president of the American Ethical Union, which is a, like the Unitarian uh, UUA, it's the Association of All Ethical Culture Societies. And uh, he still lived in them. He said, oh, you're going to Michigan. Uh, yeah, and, and you're gonna work in your offices in Birmingham. Well, are you fortunate? You've got two of my best friends there. You've got Sherwin Wine, the humanist, the Jewish guy, he's in Birmingham, and Bob Marshall, he is quite an, a character. And he and I, the three of us are in this fellowship of, human, of religious humanists we're trying to organize and with some other Unitarian ministers. And uh, I didn't know if Sherwin had any other Jewish colleagues, but uh, they're trying to organize. He said, You'll, you'll, you'll love it. Go, go visit them. Well, we didn't get to Farmington. We found out the Birmingham church was half a mile from where we live, or about a mile and a half from where we lived in Troy. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, Birmingham temple, he, which she thought was in Birmingham, and in fact, it had met at Birmingham, at Birmingham church for a while, was off in Farmington, which is at least 10 or 15 miles away. So. We were going to visit them, but we never had a chance. We were sold on VUC. The first time we met Bob Marshall, and, he, and, he, and we mentioned Howard Radis, and, he, and my friend, oh my God, he knew we were humanist minded. Oh, we still didn't really know what humanism meant. And he made, <clears throat> he made sure that we, we were in the right place. He said, as, he, as we were leaving, he said, the only play, time that God is mentioned in our church is when the janitor falls off the ladder. And well, that was funny, but we weren't sure about it. And Maryland was a little concerned. In Pittsburgh, the fellowship, we didn't, there was not much talk about Christianity or Jesus Christ or anything like that. They, they just wanted to reject what, what came before. But she was worried about this large Birmingham church and, and uh, about Christmas, about Christmas Eve. I had joined the choir and I told her, we're gonna sing on Christmas Eve, so you better come. So she told, Bob Marshall said, well, are you gonna become members? And she said, I'm gonna wait till Christmas Eve, see how, you, how that works out. Because she didn't want anything about the divinity, the uh, Christ being a divinity and uh, the son of God and all this stuff. And so after the service, it was, a, it was very pleasant. Of course, the Christmas story was related, but how related to our everyday life. And uh, it was okay. So uh, she never, she never did. She only came to future Christmas Eve services because I was singing in the choir. But otherwise, she she tolerated. But other, other than that, we became very active in the church. 
Um, one thing I forgot to mention about ethical culture, um, and as the leader mentioned to me, he said, ethical culture is promised, premised on the idea that living and honoring in accordance with ethical principles is central to what it takes to live meaning and fulfilling lives and create a world which is good for all. Well, that makes sense to us and it's sort of what Bob Marshall was talking about. We had a very bad experience with humanism when we were in Pittsburgh where we decided to visit the American Humanist Association chapter, see what was going on. I, I, I said, maybe we are humanists. But well, we were completely turned off. There was, there was, they didn't talk about doing good for the community or they talked about humanist philosophy and the great leap philosophers who talked about humanism and books about humanism, but nothing about humanism related to my life or to how we would help the community. We said, if that's humanism, forget about it. We'll take the religious end of it. So, uh, I developed, I developed a strong feeling, I guess, about humanism as I grew and BUC became more active in charge of ushers and the fire membership committee and everything else. And Marilyn was serving, was coffee chairman for a while. I think she was on the board for one year. And uh, we became pretty active, but I still didn't know I was a humanist. I knew I, I was like, I liked the religious part of what I was doing and the humanist. Well, slowly I found out, I found out that there was something called religious humanism. I found out that the fellowship of human, of fellow, of religious humanism, of humanists, uh, Bob Marshall, Howard Reyes, Sherman Wine, and also Lester Mondale, a former PUC minister and uh, incidentally a stepbrother of the former Vice President Mondale. They had they were trying to make the, this fellowship uh, larger and more important. And, if, and it turned out it became eventually the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association. And they, they felt strongly they were religious humanists. And then when Larry Larson invited me to join the BUC Humanists they were starting, I said, this sounds more to my liking. And uh, I finally realized this, I, I was a humanist and I was a religious humanist. And that integration of humanist ethical philosophy with congregational but non-theistic rituals and community activity would center on human needs, interests, and activities. So I guess I really found out that I was a humanist. So that's my journey, Jay. Wow, that's an amazing story, Larry. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your story with us. Our next speaker is uh, Terry Hall. Uh, Terry is, uh, is a co-founder of the Southeast Michigan Humanist Association. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us and so glad to uh, so excited to hear your story, Terry. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, can you hear me well? No. Yeah. All right, great. Um, I was going to focus more on the earlier part of my life and how I got to the point of becoming a humanist. Uh, I, to some degree, there are things I could talk about, the, the founding of the local chapter, which took place a number of years ago. But um, as far as history, I grew up in a, a home that had uh, a father from a Methodist background, a Trinity Methodist background, believing in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as three separate beings, and a mother who was part of the Congregational Church, which was more Unitarian-like and more liberal. In fact, the church I grew up in had been involved in the Underground Railroad back in the Civil War, so it was a well-established and, and well-respected church in town, where the other was a, a little more folksy and a little more liberal in terms of interpretation of things. And we kind of bounced back and forth between two churches, and so my the parents finally said we have to pick one or the other. And there was this big debate about which was the proper one to go to. And fortunately, we ended up in the Congregational Church because uh, that was more of a professional uh, location and one that was more open to different ideas. Um, and I was a bit of an overachiever there myself. Um, yeah, I see where John said he was an altar boy in the Catholic Church. I was an acolyte in the Congregational Church. A, a friend and I walked down the aisle ahead of time with the candles and lit the candles as the choir followers. We did that for a number of years. Uh, that got me my God and Country Award in Boy Scouts, which was kind of a long time ago. Um, 
And, but as far as, as evolution within the church, part of the overachievement part, there was a, a program where if you would attend Sunday school, every Sunday for the year, you would get this pin as an acknowledgement of having gone to Sunday school the whole year, which is, you know, that's 52 sessions of the year. And I ended up, uh, well, we traveled occasionally, and, and I, if we would go somewhere, we would go to the local congregational church so I could get my pin. I ultimately ended up with a five-year pin, which is like 250-some sessions of Sunday school. So I picked up a little bit of the, of the Christianity philosophy. And one of the things that kind of bothered me was this Trinity versus uh, unity thing. Do we believe in, in one being or, or three? I remember being in a Sunday school at a, at a different uh, church in another town. And um, there were these two mothers who were teaching the class. And on the wall, there was this poster that had you know, the three figures, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I said, you know, as congregationalists, you know, do we believe that there's three separate beings or that there's one? And one mother said, well, we believe there's three. And they said, no, we believe there's one. And I go, well, <laughs> what's going on here? And it was, these are the authority figures that all of a sudden don't have the answers. And I got to really question what was going on. Um, later, uh, a minister uh, ended up moving to another church, and before he left, uh, we met with, uh, with him, my parents and I, and he got to talking about how the, uh, the Bible wasn't to be taken literally, but more as a, an allegory of, of facts, and that a year wasn't necessarily a year, it could have been a million years as far as creation. Uh, he didn't necessarily believe in angels, he thought that they could be um, like what analogies for, for, for good people. Uh, my father was totally shocked because he was one, he came up from this traditional Methodist background. Um, but again, that sort of opened my mind. It's like, well, okay, what is the case here? Um, had a friend who wanted me to go to his Sunday school, actually to his church. He had these uh, recreational programs and we would learn Bible verses in exchange for getting little trinkets and prizes. And I remember taking some of those home, and when I explained how I was getting them, I was told that maybe that wasn't such a good idea that I would learn from this particular church, and I would move through it at that point. So again, it's like, okay, who's right and who's wrong? Um, then in high school, um, I, I was part of a program where I worked uh, half days, and it was called a co-op program, and I worked at a consumer's power in, in Jackson County in the um, engineering department, system planning institute, and I was good at math. They were looking for students that might turn into uh, engineers in the future. And I was looking for a way to escape high school half a day and make some money. And I was assigned to work with these three engineers in this single room. And one of them was a fundamentalist. The other was, was kind of, we didn't really say where he was. And the other was the son of like, a Baptist minister. And this Pentecostal guy was kept trying to convert me and tell me how I needed to be saved. And if I didn't get saved and take Jesus as my savior, I would go to hell. And at one point, this other gentleman, his father, the minister, took me aside and said, no, don't listen to this guy. He's full of crap. And again, it's like, who's right, who's wrong? Uh, one of the other people in the program, uh, who was a classmate of mine, uh, was from a Pentecostal church. And he, his, um, his family had gone to Canada during the, uh, the Civil War through the underground or whatever. And he took me to his church, which and showed me there were people that are speaking in tongues. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with that, but someone stands up and starts spouting this gibberish, which supposedly is the word of God coming out through them in this foreign tongue. And then someone else would stand up and they would say what that other person was saying. Because one had the gift of tongues, the other had the gift of interpretation. And this was like this whole psychological thing that really kind of freaked me out. What, what freaked me out even minister's wife who was up front she had one of these beehive hairdos if you remember those things it was really tall and she had her hands on the shoulders of this child and she was shaking him back and forth saying you have the power you have the power you have the power she was trying to get this guy into a trance I, that you know this to me certainly made no sense um and at that same location at, at consumers um uh, i there was a copy, it wasn't a copy service, there was a woman who did photocopies for the building, and I would occasionally go down there and have copies made, and she said, you're in the same room with this guy who's the, 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 uh, 
he's trying to convert people to being saved. You know, I said, yeah, he says, he comes down here a lot trying to get me to copy religious literature. And I don't think that's right. I don't want to do that. By the way, I'm, I'm a Unitarian. And uh, what, what would you think if, if somebody like him were saved, but not a good person, and somebody living on an island somewhere away from formal religion was a good person, but wasn't saved? Don't you think that that person should have a right to go to heaven if there's a heaven? And I think, okay, well, this is an interesting thought. And it's more like maybe we should be a little more flexible in this. Um, the following year in the local library, uh, I came across the copy of the Humans Magazine. This was uh, before I went off to college. And I looked at it and I kind of liked what I was reading. Um, and I actually joined because of seeing the magazine, because I liked the fact that it was flexible and looked at different religions. Um, I ended up going to college out in California. And I was not too far from the, uh, the main humanist office then in San Francisco. I was on the El Camino del Mar, this huge house overlooking the, uh, the bay. And uh, I got to meet a number of the humanist leaders there. Um, and as well, um, uh, I, this was the time of Vietnam. And I wasn't, I, there were, I knew I didn't want to be participating in the Vietnam War. To me, that was wrong. I felt that these people had a right to their own self-determination and that we were trying to impose our will on them. And I, I wanted to be conscientious objector that most of the COs were in formal religions. And I said, well, what the heck, I'm going to try to be a CO as a humanist. So I applied to my local draft board as a humanist conscientious objector. And in the process, um, being involved with the anti-war movement, I got to meet some fairly prominent uh, uh, humanists, including uh, Linus Pauling, who was a professor where I was going to school, had an opportunity to interview him for an article I was doing. I, I majored in journalism and, and psychology both. And I really enjoyed meeting a lot of these folks and being part of that, that philosophy. Uh, fortunately, the lottery came in at that point. I didn't have to go to the board to finally you know, decide if I could be a CEO or not. Uh, I got a good lottery number and I was out. But, it was a really tough time because everybody was examining their values. And do you or do you not want to get drafted? Um, do you want to go to Canada? Do you want to go to prison? What are you going to do? So uh, that to me was how I formally got into the, the humanist movement. Um, at some point, um, uh, I submitted a book review to the humanist magazine uh, about um, uh, Jonas Salk, who I had read a book about. It was called The Survival of the uh, Wise. Survival of the Wisest, I believe, is something of that nature. I've got it here somewhere. And uh, I submitted it to the Humanist Magazine as a, to be published. And instead of publishing my book review, they decided they were going to call him Humanist of the Year. And he became awarded Humanist of the Year in Buffalo, New York, or just outside of Buffalo. This was Paul Kurtz at the time. He was out there at State University of New York. And uh, I don't think it was Tony Regardless, it was out there in California, near Buffalo. And I got a chance to, to meet John Salk. I got him to sign the book, uh, which was nice. And uh, while there, I met a number of folks from Detroit who were there at the same AHA conference. And we decided to form a chapter uh, of the AHA shortly afterwards. And we met for quite a few years. Um, we also hosted the uh, AHA annual uh, convention in Dearborn. Um, at the time, uh, Lloyd and Mary Moraine were given the awards. I had gotten to know them in San Francisco. They were natives out there and major benefactors to the organization. Um, and we went on for quite a few years. Uh, I was one of the original chartered members, and slowly over time, the members sort of moved away or, or passed, passed on to other directions, literally. And so it, it pretty much came to me to do the newsletters and get speakers and um, Handle, and handle the mailing list. And I was in law school at the time, and uh, it was a fairly significant burden, but we continued for a while. I did get married. Um, I got to know, uh, there was mention, uh, did Larry go? Oh, there you are. You moved around on the screen. Um, I, uh, I got to know Sherwin Wine uh, through the Fellowship of Religious Humanists. He had a conference at his temple, and I also met Bob Marshall there and did become part of BUC actually before getting married and having a family. Um, my, uh, uh, we ended up getting married by um, the successor to Bob Marshall. 
Oh dear, I wrote it down. Never mind. Who, who succeeded Bob Marshall? Help me with that. Uh, anybody? Uh, I'm already tempered. Doug, Doug, Doug Gallagher. Yeah, Doug. Thank you. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, we um, we the time of our marriage, there was a, a, a rum sale going on, so the church was pretty well crowded, and we ended up going out to the Farmington Union Church, which is a really beautiful old church out there. If anybody hasn't been there, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, we had three kids. They went through Sunday school. I taught Sunday school at BC for a number of years, and I did like the program that it covered a number of different religions, comparative religions. So um, that's sort of Part of, part of the journey. It was a matter of questioning, trying to figure out, and then realizing nobody has the answer. Let's try to go to a place where we respect different opinions, where we learn from other traditions, and where we feel like we can be accepted for not necessarily knowing the truth, but being open to, to understanding more about others and, and trying to, to live a good life. So, uh, nutshell, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for sharing your your journey with us. Okay, so this should conclude the uh, uh, the speaker uh, section of our meeting. Oh, excuse me, may I make one more comment? Uh, yes. I, I'm probably a little late for that. Um, as a follow-up to the last meeting, there was discussion about uh, humanist psychology and, and um, Abraham Maslow, and also someone had asked about a law case involving being able to be a non-theist and, and being a government. Uh, I did recall the case that was that was there. I posted it as a chat item. Uh, it was uh, uh, Roy Torcaso versus um, Watkins, I believe. It was a Maryland case. And there is a U.S. Supreme Court that says you don't have to ha have it to God in order to have a government position. And that case was was quoted and probably a little late to be looking it up, but I posted it. And anybody in, in the future can look it up. And it's T-O-R-C-A-S-O versus Watkins. I was actually in the late 60s that that came through. And that is the law. You don't have to swear to God in order to have a government position. So thank you for that. Terry, maybe you can share that also in an email to us. I, I'd love to to uh, learn more about what you just shared. Yeah. I'm always interested in learning about um, things like that. So we'd appreciate okay, a sure. follow-up email. That would be great for all of us. Uh, should I send that to you then, uh, Jay? You can send it to, yeah, you can send it to me if you have my right, email. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. I'd be happy to do that. I put those two links in there. I don't want to overdo it here, but I think those are good things. The link to, the one has got some excerpts from Maslow's book and the other has just quotes the case. You can look it up on um, Wikipedia. They give a good history about it as well. So okay. Thank Thanks, Terry. All right. So I was hoping that we have more time and I'm willing to sit here and wait for another hour if needed for us to go through the question and answers. I do want to uh, give you guys uh, just a heads up. The meeting was scheduled for an hour, so I'm not sure what's going to happen when it is exactly 8 o'clock. I yeah. hope Zoom will allow us to continue with our meeting. But if that happens, uh, please don't be alarmed. Hopefully we can continue the discussion at the next meeting if, that's, if that shuts down. So we are right now at the question and answers. Wow, that was a great, great uh, five speeches. So at this stage, if you do have any questions, please raise your electronic hand. And if you actually are using just a land-based phone, you can always do that with a star nine. Uh, so do we have any questions? I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everyone at this stage. So you can also just speak if you'd like, but if you wanna raise your hand, I will also introduce you for uh, the team. So any questions? Yeah, Jay, I've got a question. Uh, in case we get cut off, um, could you say something about uh, our next meeting with uh, Sure. Uh, Let's take care of that. Paul right. Plant. That's a, Paul yeah, Plant. That's a, yeah, that's a good that's a good thing. Maybe we need to take care of that before uh, we may get cut off. So our next meeting is scheduled for Sunday, uh, July the 12th at 7 p.m. Our feature speaker will be Professor Ed Sharples. Uh, Ed Sharples has served on the board of BUC many, many years. He is also a professor. Uh, he's a dean, I believe, of his uh, department. And so please mark your calendar. And uh, also, obviously, if you are interested in joining our committee, planning committee, please contact Larry Larson. 
and I'm sure all of you are getting your emails, but if anyone else wants to get on our distribution list, please check with Larry Friedman. So let's go back to the questions and answer. I think we should be good. But, but Jay, Jay yes. I think uh, Ed Chappells is going to be the, toward the end of July. And uh, Paul Plant is on the 12th. Oh, I'm sorry. I Ed Sherples, aware of that. Ed Sherples is on the 26th. And Ed, uh, Ed uh, Paul Plant is going to talk on the topic, uh, help to humans. Hmm. He's, uh, he's really big on the uh, community organizations that uh, we often support. SOS, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and, uh, and Lighthouse. Okay. And the right. Greening of Detroit. <clears throat> so thanks for the correction. I, I thought it was Ed Sharple, but uh, all right, let's make sure that everybody has their calendar <laughs> marked for a poll for the 12th of July, and at the end of the month, we'll have Ed Sharples. The 26th, yeah. Okay. All right. Any Thank questions? You. Any questions or comments? I have I have some questions and comments myself. So, no one wants to ask a question. I have a question for Larry Larson. You mentioned uh, at the time when uh, you and Larry Friedman were starting the humanist at BUC, you were you had some concerns at the time. I believe it was Kathy, right? At the time, can you tell yes. us more about what was going on in that time? Why was she concerned? Well, she was on a sabbatical, and we decided to form, form this uh, committee and develop programs uh, without uh, without her consent. I mean, we didn't anticipate any problem, but she uh, she thought, "Oh my gosh, what's happening? Are you are you going to be proselytizing humanism and diminishing?" People that are Buddhists and Christians, and are you going to try to uh, be divisive? And she finally, after talking to me and Roland Friesinger, decided that she was mistaken, that we uh, had no intention of being divisive or. Uh, trying to proselytize and talk people out of their spirituality. And so uh, that's about it. And then she became quite supportive. And as I said, uh, Reverend Mandy is very supportive too. She's talked to our group a couple times already. All right, thanks, Larry. Any, any other questions for the speakers? Any other questions, guys? Well, I I guess I have a question uh, for uh, is it Tim Hall? Terry. Sure. No, I see. Who, who, who is what, question? Your... I can see. Uh, are you Mr. Terry? Go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. Ask the question to Terry Hall. Yes. Oh, Terry Hall. Okay, excuse me. Um, have you? Uh, would you call yourself a religious humanist? Or um, actually, I like. Uh, I, I heard Sherman Wine quite a few times, and he was a regular speaker at BUC for a number of years until his unfortunate passing. And um, one of the things, well, now we have side story too. Um, we had a number of members from different organizations as part of our humanist chapter. Uh, among them were some atheists. And um, there was a convention in, I think it was Dearborn also, with Madeline Murray O'Hare as the main speaker. I'm not sure if any of you were aware of that at the time, but uh, we had a little sub meeting in one of the hotel rooms of our chapter with her and her, her uh, one of her sons and her granddaughter. And uh, she was talking about people that um, didn't con didn't call themselves atheists. Let me see. She, she said humanists and agnostics were chicken atheists. 
<laughs> and, um, you know, excuse me, but, you know, I, I kind of like Sherwin Wine's idea about I'm not, I'm, I'm more agnostic, but his philosophy was in a way I'm more agnostic. I don't know and I don't care. It's not that important anymore. Seriously, how much, how much is divine intervention part of what's going on here? And today we got some real problems, which is around today what's going on. So to some degree, it's not that important. Um, I'm a, a fairly religious person in some ways. I, I do meditate regularly. It's, I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things out there that we can learn from, from other people and, and can appreciate nature, like, like John had said. Um, but as far as formal religion, no, no, no particular philosophy, just a matter of trying to respect others and have hopefully be respected as well. And, uh, you know, maybe help others, like with this Black Lives Movement thing, uh, achieve their more actuality. And that goes back to Abraham Maslow. You know, you can't really achieve your, uh, your evolution without having your basic needs met. And we need, as a, as a culture, to help people reach their basic needs so that they can go beyond just having to fight to get food and, and uh, electricity and all these various things. So uh, it's more of a social thing than it is a a religious thing in, in terms of traditional religion. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. That's kind of where I'm coming from. So you would say, would you say that ceremonies are not, uh, or rituals are not um, well, really yes, necessary? No. Let me say too, by the way, I, when I was in, in California, I also checked out a few other religions. There was a guy from Indonesia who, who was part of Subud International, which is farmer out in the field who got this revelation and he started talking in tongues and they had people that marched around the room and chanted and kind of had these, these um, spiritual um, spiritual senses. You know, there were folks that were into Esalen Institute and learning how to uh, you know, actualize yourself in those ways. And there was a few chemicals out there as well. So you, you could expand your consciousness. Um, I think I, there's a lot more to the mind and the reality than most people appreciate. And I'd like to think that I can still learn that. So as far as, yeah, I'd like to think my evolution is still continuing. Uh, I think groups like this can, can help each other get to that direction. Um, and then, and then just to, yeah. Thank you, Terry. All right, thank you. Thanks, Larry, and thanks, Terry. Uh, Terry, I'm also a big believer of Maslow's. I bring that up all the time. All right, good. I, uh, I talk about it. I think I can probably share more on another uh, meeting. Um, yeah, it's been a like, long time since I've studied it. I'm not exactly up on it that much, but I know so the hierarchy. Yeah. Yeah. It would be worth more talking. Yeah, it definitely would be a good talk. All right, Brad, seems like you have a question there. Uh, yeah, Jay, I need, I need to... Uh, I'm getting prodded by the my other folks here for the. Uh, I have a hard stop uh, at at uh, at this time, so I have I have to excuse myself. All right, thank okay, you. Thank you very much for hosting us. Thanks, Brad. Good to see everyone. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? I have one. Okay, go ahead. Uh I am, well, first I should introduce myself. I'm at the Birmingham Unitarian Church. Uh, it, uh, anyway, it's too long to explain. I, um, I am Mary Samal. I have, you know, no church affiliation. Uh, I have a question for you humanists. What do you hold down to when the chips are truly down? Uh, the reason I ask this, uh, my father spent five years in a Nazi concentration camp. And one of the things he always said, uh, that the people who survived, who did the best in the camps, were people who had some sort of transcendental belief. Those were priests and communists. <laughs> so this is my question. Okay, anybody wanna take that one on? Well, we uh, most uh, humanists uh, really shy away from any Let thought of he heaven and hell, and that uh, until there's some scientific proof of life hereafter, uh, most of us uh, certainly don't believe in an afterlife. 
Well, but the good we feel that the, the good we do will live on forever. I would comment here too, if I may. Um, I, I mentioned I practice meditation. I've done that for a number of years. That, that's a way of finding peace and escaping things that may be causing tension. And I think that's a good way of going inside and, and becoming more in touch with yourself and not the sort of shedding the outside issues that are causing problems. And uh, one other thing, maybe another topic for another time, but and this probably goes back into my evolution as a humanist. Um, as a child, I, um, I fell off a dock in a lake and drowned. And um, I was rescued by someone who used the old fashioned artificial respiration to bring me back. But I had basically stopped me and I went into the, the tunnel they talk about, the white tunnel. And I, I was gone basically. And, and then I recall hearing voices and there was a child who was saying, well, is he, is he going to come back and whatever. And then I remember saying, oh crap, you know, I, I drowned. And um, they were, I could feel the thing on my back. Originally I said, don't bother me. This is really peaceful. It's me being home. But then when I heard the voice, just like the kitty cat, <laughs> uh, I said, well, maybe, maybe I want to come back here. And I, I struggled and all of a sudden, like, you know, like whoomp, I came right back into my body. But before that, it was it was peaceful. You know, it was, there was nothing going on. It was black. It, I went through the white tunnel, but after that, there was nothing but peace. And and my thought was, leave me alone. I'm okay here. And so, so I don't I don't welcome the idea of dying, but at the same time, I'm not afraid of it. And I, I think that's something that uh, was a liberating in, in many ways. So, uh, but meditation again is a way of. of of shedding the outside and becoming more inside and becoming more in touch with yourself and, and being more centered, which I think is helpful. I can jump in real quick here. I know that for me, when the chips are down, I always rely on what is actually real. If I'm gonna make a good decision, it's gonna be based on what actually is going to um, have an effect based on reality. I also know that there have been studies that looked at the whole question of atheists and foxhole things, and, and the whole thing's a fallacy. Um, there's, there's no evidential support for the idea that atheists suddenly become more superstitious or supernaturally based when they're in trouble. It, the opposite seems to be the case. Did any comment on that? So I can share my comments. I'm, I'm always fascinated by human nature, Mary. I'm also, also fascinated by the human mind. So when I look at the human uh, history and how we evolved and how we evolved from living in tribes and, and becoming more and more sociable, right? And we develop all these different societies and we are definitely going in the, in the right direction, right? There's always going to be different difficult times. Uh, but eventually, I think as, a, as, a, as humans, we are going to evolve to be able to resolve many of the issues that have um, plagued us uh, regarding to conflict and regarding to hunger and those things. I think those issues, uh, with, with enough time, I think, and enough leadership, I think will get resolved. So that's the positive, I think. Uh, the, the, trajectory, the trajectory is always going in the right direction. There are going to be difficult times still in our history, kind of like the history that we're currently going through right now in many part of the world. There's a lot of conflict. There's still a lot of, a lot of misery. There's still, but it is getting better. So that, that's my hope. I'm always looking for the positive side of um, the human history. Uh, I just want to make sure you understand. I wasn't challenging you. I was just offering that as... That something that I I I had I know because it was my father's experience and my father never became religious. So he was a communist. No, he wasn't a communist. <laughs> no. Uh, there are uh, you know uh, there are choices between the two extremes. Right. Uh, well, how, how did he survive? If he was either of the two, what was his what, what was his technique? Ah. Uh, I think he he was a, a humanist and a and a and a nationalist. Uh, his 
big thing was to try to keep the people uh, of his nationality together. And uh, the reason he was in the camp is that uh, I would check. And he worked in the anti-Nazi underground. And they got caught in, with the results uh, of being put in, in into a concentration camp. One of our humanist chapter members was a child in Czechoslovakia during the war, and she's told stories about that as well. Um, and I'm trying to recall her name, but yeah, there was a tough, tough time, real challenges. So, it, I mean, we've got a medical challenge now, but that certainly was a much bigger challenge for a lot of people. And, and very tough time. So it was good that he made it through, and good you're here to tell us about it. Yeah, thanks, Mary, for sharing sharing your question with us. Uh, are there any other comments? Any other questions? Any other comments from uh, Larry Friedman and Larry Larson? Anybody else from the planning committee? Steve, anything from your side, David? No, I have a comment. Yeah. Yes, Larry. Uh, I think it was John mentioned a quote from uh, Carl Sagan which I found interesting. I know of another quote. I, about two years ago, I attended a program on astronomy at Penn State University. It was a Rhodes Scholar program. <clears throat> and there was one session on science, astronomy and, and religion. And the uh, professor giving that quoted Carl Sagan with these, these words, when you enter someone's heart, you live forever. And I found that uh, very uh, inspiring for me. That, um, of course, Carl Sagan is not only a great astrophysicist; he was a he's a great humanist. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, it's too bad he too bad he's not with us still. I have the same feeling about John Lennon. I mean, so many good people out there. You know, Martin Luther King, all these good folks that just, of course, in his case, it was an illness. But still, um, we, we need to value and. and preserve the ideas of people that we think were, were, were wise, such as Carl, he was, a, he was an excellent person. Of course, his wife now, Andrew, and she's continuing things as well. Um, and he's living on through her, just like this, like you said, you know, he's in her heart and, and she's continuing to carry forward his, his ideas. So thank you for the quote. Okay. Larry Freeman. Go ahead, Larry. Um, Larry Freeman, I, I wanted to comment on this quote. It seems like if you show love to someone, it, it can last uh, forever. If you're in someone's heart, it, it goes on. I think that's uh, definitely. Uh, so uh, it's the same as goodness. Uh, goodness never dies. But I enjoyed the meeting. It's uh, it was interesting to have five speakers, and um, I really appreciate it. Jay? Yes, Larry. Uh, I just wondered if anyone else wants to share their thoughts about how, what, you know, when they became a humanist or how. Uh, yeah, I was gonna, a discussion. I was going to try to kind of move back into that, asking people to share their opinion if we should have more of those meetings in the future where we are given the chance to uh, share our journey. What What is the take here? What do you guys, what does everyone think? Uh, is this something we should do? To me, I think this is very, very important. Uh, sharing our journey is important, but I want to hear from everyone, see what, what you guys think. Should we have more of those those meetings in the future? What's our attendance today, uh, Jay? Uh, let's see, we have it's 12 people right now. Um, I had a yeah, little trouble finding the link to join this. Uh, what I had turned out to be for the previous meeting, uh, is it possible that the incorrect link was sent out or did I just not save the correct one? Um, we might have had more. We had twice as many last time. We sent it out twice. It seemed to work. 
Yeah, yeah I, I looked all over for, for the link. Um, and yeah. it's on the it's always on the BUC website too. Yeah, that's also really how I got through, and that was good to have. I it. had to yeah. use the BUC website to get in. I couldn't get yeah. in through the link that was sent in the last email. Okay. Mm. Thank you, Joe, for sharing so, that with us. It's good to have those three options. I guess the regular telephone, the BUC link, and then the direct links. So, uh, we had to hunt a little bit. We may have lost some folks if that was the case. But uh, hopefully we, we can uh, preserve more people. I, I was glad to see that the list from the, the newer version of the Humans to Southeast Michigan was uh, made available. And uh, we had uh, Kim Moon, I believe, who's helping coordinate that. Uh, that was a, sort of a revival of the previous chapter. And uh, there were close to a thousand people in there. So, uh, and, and the mailing list, the meetup group was, was uh, basically uh, absorbed by Kim. And she has the ability to communicate through that. So anything that uh, we would like to communicate through her, I think that she'd be happy to share. This uh, meeting had the lowest attendance we, we've ever had. So it's, I don't think it was a popular topic uh, for some reason. Because I, mean, uh, I think we need something that's that. more popular for the whole congregation. You could throw in a couple of these, how I became a a humanist end with some other topics, just have a couple of those just to either at the beginning or at the end, just for the hell of it. Yeah, that's a, that's an idea. I mean, rather than have a, a program special for it. Well, like next uh, in two weeks, uh, Paul Plant has said he's only going to be able to talk for about 15 minutes because he, he's not used to long, long talks. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion, and uh, we could say, uh, "I'm a, my humanism has made me a, a charitable activist, or I'm interested in political activism because I'm a humanist. We need a lot of participation in two weeks. Sounds like a good plan, Larry. Yeah. Maybe we can get a couple of speakers from our group to speak and give their views on how humanists have uh, made them uh, social activists. Yeah, I, I hope so. I think uh, just talking about it now should uh, inspire somebody to huh. write down some questions or give a testimony. All right. Very good. It is 8.22 right now. Are there any comments? Uh, I really enjoyed uh, uh, today's meeting. That was really fun. I really enjoyed hosting it. And Thanks for hosting. Thank you. Uh, listening to all, all the stories. So that was really fun. Maybe you can share yours next time. I, I will. I definitely will <laughs> share with you guys my story. It's kind of funny, though. Hearing the stories, there's a running theme. It's just kind of the same thing, man. So, well, uh, no, it was really fun. Good night, everyone. We'll see you at the next one.